Hi, my name is Troy Parfit, and I'm the author of The Devil and His Due, How Jordan Peterson Plagiarizes Adolf Hitler, and the name of today's talk is Jordan Peterson and the Big Lie. So I thought we would start this talk with a question. Jordan Peterson has repeatedly said that all of his work is predicated on one subject. What is the subject? What motivates Jordan Peterson? What gets him out of bed in the morning? What drives him to do what he does? All of his books, speeches, interviews, and lectures are about a single topic, a specialized topic that can be expressed in two words. The first word is an article, the second a noun. Do you know? Care to guess? It's the Holocaust. Did you know that? Be honest. I ask because I have never heard any of Peterson's adherents critics, or any journalists mention this, which is to say I have never heard anyone frame his lectures, speeches, writings, etc. against the subject of the Holocaust. Never. And yet, he has been making this claim for decades. At Harvard, in 1996, during the first class of his Maps of Meaning course, he said his aim was to arrive at, quote, a concrete answer about why people are capable of doing the sorts of things that characterized Nazi behavior, say, during the Holocaust. End quote. He emphasized that he wanted to make the answer, quote, crystal clear, so that it's socially and personally applicable, and so you also get a glimpse, perhaps, of what might be necessary from the perspective of personal and interpersonal conduct to alleviate the likelihood that you'll get trapped into doing something like that. End quote. Please note the word trapped. We'll come back to that later. Put another way, Peterson claimed to be rescuing his psychology students at Harvard in 1996 from the clutches of Nazism and a life of crime, the systematized murder of innocence. I guess someone had to. I imagine that in Boston, Peterson's undergrads found genocidal temptation around every corner. Bear in mind that Peterson's first class at Harvard is the oldest available footage we have of him speaking. The first PowerPoint slide we see him use is entitled The Nature of the Problem, and the first bullet point on that slide reads The Holocaust. Just two and a half minutes into the lecture, he begins to talk about the Holocaust. He asks, what is it that's so important about a belief system that would lead people to do things, normal people, as far as I'm concerned, to commit acts that under normal circumstances would be conceived of as incomprehensible, even by those people. In other words, what beliefs would spur normal people to participate in Nazi-style genocide? Of course, this implies that Nazis like Dr. Joseph Mengele, who amputated children's limbs without the use of anesthetic in the name of Nazi science, were normal. In 2017, at the Ottawa Public Library, during a tirade in which Peterson was trying to convince his audience to believe that liberal educators and education programs were pure evil, Peterson reformulated his mission statement, telling a blue-collar audience that his classroom at the U of T was no safe space. As he explained, In my classes, and I tell my students this right at the beginning, I'm trying to get them to understand why they are Nazis. Right. There isn't anything more unsafe than that. On March 8, 2021, six days after the publication of his third book, Beyond Order, Twelve More Rules for Life, Jordan Peterson told Brett Weinstein that when he wrote his first book, Maps of Meaning, which he began in 1985 and published in 1999, he was trying to, quote, account for malevolence of the genocidal sort, I suppose, I suppose, like he's not quite sure, at the individual level, motivation for genocide, and then to also outline how that might be avoided given that it's a pronounced human propensity, far more pronounced than we like to admit, and I spent 15 years thinking about that, and that was Maps of Meaning, end quote. Observe how he said he wanted to outline preventative measures, whereas at Harvard he said he wanted measures that were crystal clear. In any event, he then said, quote, all of the, many of the ideas that I developed in 12 Rules for Life and Beyond Order stem from maps of meaning, so certainly much of what I've done in my career as a lecturer owes its success to the 15 years of three-hour days that I put in on that book, end quote. These claims are dubious, 
and raise a number of questions. If Peterson was so consumed by the Holocaust, why didn't he earn a PhD in history or Holocaust studies and write his thesis on the Holocaust? Instead, he studied psychology, and his thesis is called Potential Markers for the Predisposition to Alcoholism. Why do none of Peterson's books state that they are mostly about the Holocaust or offer advice on how genocides can be avoided? Why did Peterson claim he tells his students right at the beginning of his course that he's trying to get them to understand why they are Nazis, when it seems he never tells them this at the beginning and only appears to have implied it a few times during the course of his career? Why does Peterson only talk about the Holocaust sparingly and in passing? Why does he never unpack what happened during the Holocaust? Where's the breadth? Where's the depth? I mean, have you ever heard him say something like, Today's lecture is going to be on the Holocaust, or we're going to focus on the timeline of events that led to the final solution. I know you haven't, because he never says anything like this. His lectures are described as being about the Bible, personality traits, mythology, or the ideas of psychologists or novelists, but never about the Holocaust. If Maps of Meaning is about the Holocaust, why does Peterson's follow-up, 12 Rules for Life, say... His book, Maps of Meaning, revolutionized the psychology of religion. Why does the word Holocaust appear in his three books just 11 times? That's once every 170 pages. Why does the word Holocaust not appear in his latest book, Beyond Order, at all? Two of Peterson's books, 12 Rules for Life and Beyond Order, are self-help books. How could self-help books be about the Holocaust? Imagine buying a book about the rape of Nanjing, a massacre in which as many as 300,000 unarmed Chinese civilians were butchered by the Japanese Imperial Army. You open the book and see that chapter 1 is entitled, Rule 1, Stand Up Straight With Your Shoulders Back. You start reading and discover that it appears to be about how much you have in common with lobsters. You scan the rest of the tome and find that it hardly touches on the Nanjing massacre, but that it does include a chapter called Rule 12, Pet a Cat When You Encounter One on the Street. You see a section about a chimpanzee named Satan who drank the blood of another chimpanzee. And you encounter a sentence that claims Lucifer is the spirit of reason and the most wondrous angel brought forth from the void by God. You flip to the About the Author section and read the line, The author has flown a hammerhead roll in a carbon fiber stunt plane. What would you think? I might think that the author was insane or that the publisher was having a laugh. Jordan Peterson is published by Rutledge and Penguin. Keeping in mind that the word Holocaust appears in Peterson's writings just 11 times, why does the word occult appear 8 times? Why does the name of the Egyptian sun god Horus appear 51 times? Clearly, Peterson thinks that discussing a mythological bird in his Holocaust-themed books is more important than describing the torment and murder of the Jews. Why? Why did the words devil, Satan, Lucifer, and Mephistopheles exist in Peterson's writing 165 times? And why does the subject of alchemy crop up a whopping 263 times? What do these references, and virtually everything else Peterson writes about, for example witches, gorgons, hydras, snakes, beasts, rats, cats, monsters, and satanic possession, have to do with Hitler's extermination of two-thirds of Europe's Jews. In Peterson's three books, why is there not a single image related to World War II? There are no photos of the Lodz ghetto, no map showing the network of death in concentration camps, no pictures of Nazis at the Auschwitz railhead, no shots of the Nuremberg trials, yet we get images of dragons, castles, kings, knights, the devil, there are four pictures of the devil in Peterson's books, in three of them, Satan looks quite handsome, I think Peterson might be trying to tell us something. The yin and yang symbol, Michelangelo's David, the serial murderer, Karl Panzram, who is so special, he, he raped and killed children, that he receives two pictures. Buddhist art named The Eternal Return of the Bodhisattva, and a comic strip called The Adventures of Fat Freddy's Cat. We also get an occultic poem, a recreation of an occultic tarot card that was originally commissioned by a Satanist, Gnostic poetry, symbolism from Freemasonry, verse about Odin, allusions to Norse mythology, lessons on Egyptology, as well as nods to Hinduism, Taoism, Buddhism, and Christianity. Why? But then, why would Peterson say he got the word being, capitalized, from the philosopher Martin Heidegger, 
From 1933 to 1945, Heidegger was a card-carrying member of the Nazi party. He was a Nazi propagandist, stumping for Hitler on the radio and on campus. For example, he told his students to support the Fuhrer, and he chastised fellow professors who didn't support the Fuhrer. After the war, Heidegger remained unrepentant and probably believed in the National Socialist Movement until he died in 1976. He said nothing about the Jews who had disappeared from his town, and although he remained a highly productive writer, he never penned a sentence about the Holocaust. Peterson has defended Heidegger for subscribing to Nazism. He told his students that Heidegger's support for the cause proved that intelligent people could also be Nazis. Peterson has routinely described himself as intelligent. Why would Jordan Peterson defend Martin Heidegger for being a Nazi? Why is Jordan Peterson's favorite philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche? Apart from being deranged, for Nietzsche was barking mad long before he hugged the horse, that his pernicious beliefs were enthusiastically adopted by the German and Italian fascists is commonly known. In Beyond Order, the book about the Holocaust that doesn't mention the Holocaust, Peterson cites two translations of The Will to Power. Two, you know, you have to be thorough. A copy of which Hitler gifted to Mussolini. Peterson almost certainly knows this because it's mentioned in a book called Nietzsche and the Nazis, which was written by his friend, Stephen Hicks. Peterson has read and recommends another book by Hicks that criticizes postmodernism. In Beyond Order, Peterson also talks about Nietzsche's Übermensch, given that he has said that the Übermensch was a concept that the Nazis quote-unquote pulled off, why would he do that? He's opposed to the Nazis, but admires German philosophers who inspired the Nazis, or who were Nazis? Why has Peterson said that neo-Nazism is the best and the most optimal conceivable group to be a member of? Why has he suggested that we revitalize this group? Yes, he really said this, I documented and provide sources in The Devil and His Due. Why has he said that the answer to the question, what is the good, is being a Nazi? Being a Nazi is good? When talking about a Hitler Youth propaganda poster, why did he say that Hitler and a boy were looking far ahead into the future? That's right. That's good. Why does he often associate the Nazis with the word good? For instance, he has said that Hitler was good at speaking, good at listening, good at order, good at spectacle, good at reindustrializing, that is, creating a war economy, and that the Germans were good at order. Perhaps when he uses the word good, he means to say bad, but he just forgets? Why has Peterson positively raved about Hitler, branding him intelligent, charismatic, compelling, a master of speech, a master of dark fire, a possessor of black magic, and someone who is deserving of our admiration because he was an organizational genius? What did Hitler organize that made him such a genius? When I asked this question to Peterson's followers, one said that Hitler was good at organizing the Holocaust, and that if I tried to kill Jews, I would probably only be able to kill two, because I lacked Hitler's organizational skills. Why has Peterson gushed about the orderly perfection of Nuremberg rallies and gotten all hot and bothered by columns of Hitler's men striding about in jackboots, given that Peterson has repeatedly linked gay men to AIDS and said nasty things about the LGBTQ plus community? This seems strange. Why has Peterson characterized Wilhelm Trapp, a Nazi commander and convicted war criminal, as humane? Why has he called members of Trapp's death squad, who murdered 83,000 Jews, decent guys? Why has he claimed that Adolf Eichmann, who helped oversee the final solution and who became a convicted war criminal, was just a mama's boy, an ordinary bureaucrat, and in no way a psychopath? Eichmann boasted about playing a part in the deaths of five million people, yet Peterson characterized him as normal, if not admirable. Why? Why has Peterson criticized the Canadian government for prosecuting a neo-Nazi named Ernst Sundel? Why did he tell his listeners that they had better wake up and push back against such oppression, implying that if they didn't, the government would soon be coming after them? Why did he fail to mention that Zundel was sentenced to two years in prison in Canada for posing a threat to national security, and five years in Germany for inciting racial hatred against the Jews? Why has Peterson said, You want to burn everything that the person who disgusts you owns, and so you'll see people who are pushing the nationalist agenda hard, and Hitler did this beautifully. Everything that was outside of the Aryan domain of purity wasn't to be feared. 
It was disgusting. It was contemptuous. And it should be destroyed and purified by fire. And that was his message. The Nazis were unbelievably great at using fire of purification as a symbolic message. Translation, the Nazis were unbelievably great at burning non-Aryans in their campaign of racial purification, and Hitler burned non-Aryans beautifully, men, women, and children. This statement is shocking, and I've collected perhaps 40 pages of such utterances. Jordan Peterson blathering about the splendors of Adolf Hitler and his murderous thugs in a state of mania or with a kind of childlike glee. Obviously, when Jordan Peterson says he is trying to rescue people from becoming Nazis, he's lying. But then Peterson lies about just about everything, and nearly all the time. He is a practiced, inveterate, and dedicated liar. He has said, in a boastful fashion, that Hitler was elected by a landslide, that he was a brave frontline soldier, that he could give the Zieg Heil for eight hours straight while standing in the back of a car, that he was nearly killed by a shell while in the trenches that all of his friends were killed by the shell, that he wasn't, and I quote, particularly pathological, that he was obsessed with personal hygiene, that he ordered his underlings to fumigate Germany's factories with Zyklon B. All of these claims, most of them laudatory, are patently untrue, uttered by an unfeeling narcissist and psychopath who, I repeat, lies pretty much constantly. Moreover, he lies at the behest of a voice with eyes that appeared in his mind after he experienced a psychological split in his early 20s, or so he tells us in Maps of Meaning. And by split, he means a fragmentation of the mind, a descent into schizophrenia. He describes how he began hearing an admonishing voice that commented on nearly everything he said, and then he cites a paper on schizophrenia called Hearing Voices. He also lists other symptoms of schizophrenia, in a book that he says is about the Holocaust, a book that was initially called War, Cause and Cure. There is no cure for war, but there are, of course, cures for illnesses. I believe the war Peterson had in mind was a war in his mind. He has spoken about what he calls avatars and subpersonalities bickering in his mind. Perhaps because he's a psychologist, people assume he's talking about someone else but his narcissism ensures that he's usually talking about himself. Anyway, after talking about his psychological split in maps, he hints at being on the brink of insanity. He reveals that he must appease the voice by telling the truth, which is to say, a litany of lies. Peterson's claims about the natural and social sciences are mostly balderdash, and his academic work is quackery. His ideas are believed by poorly educated and resentful men who venerate Peterson, a living, breathing Pinocchio, as some kind of god. When not lying, Peterson uses language that's ambiguous and takes advantage of people's good nature. For instance, when he says he is interested in understanding why ordinary people would participate in genocide, you would assume that he meant he was interested in this subject because he thought genocide was horrible, like with so many other educators. But in this case, your assumption would be wrong. By lying, Peterson fools people. By employing ambiguous language, he helps them fool themselves. And they often pay him for the privilege. Dupable people service his narcissistic supply. He is a con artist, a fraud. He's playing a joke on everyone, including you. Peterson likes to tell his followers that Carl Jung believed that you could not understand someone's motives by listening to their speech. Instead, you had to observe their actions. Whether Jung really said this or not, I don't know. Peterson often misquotes and misrepresents Jung and just about everyone else he discusses. But when Peterson makes this claim, he's almost certainly trying to send his audience a message. Something like, don't you see? I'm not really trying to achieve my stated aims. Those aims just serve as my cover story. Why do you think I habitually praise Hitler and characterize the liberals as communists? Some of Peterson's fans have received the message. They make anti-Semitic comments, echo Peterson's claims and lies about Hitler, for example by calling him a genius, and they allude to passages from Mein Kampf. Many others are bullies, bigots, homophobes, and misogynists. However, others in his movement genuinely don't get it. Peterson presents himself as a wise and helpful father figure, a miracle worker who has helped thousands of lost men get their lives together and achieve success. When his followers converse with one another or attack critics, they tend to imitate Peterson's speech. They are members of a cult, and most probably don't even realize it. Peterson fills their heads with rubbish. 
His talk about dragons, knights, kings, snakes, Norse mythology, Egyptology, Taoism, etc., all part of the vokish esoteric beliefs that fueled Nazi ideology, by the way, works as a filter. What I mean is, if you tell people you're on a mission to prevent another holocaust, and then prattle on about the marvels of Horus and alchemy, and people think it's interesting and don't notice the incongruity, that is, that you haven't so much as mentioned the Holocaust. Such people are likely primed to be told just about anything. For instance, you could tell them that besides you, your coterie of white supremacist and alt-right crank associates, better known as the intellectual dark web, along with a short list of dead white men who wrote books in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, that everyone else is their enemy. Educators, including kindergarten teachers, women, lawmakers, liberals, women, prosecutors who go after neo-Nazis, members of the LGBTQ plus community, university administrators, the Canadian Senate, women, the Ontario Human Rights Commission, empaths, the police, and finally, let's not forget, women. Peterson's hatred for women is limitless. The enemies of the cult leader become the enemies of the cult followers, no questions asked. The cult followers attack those enemies and protect the cult leader. This is also what happened in the Third Reich. The National Socialists were a state-backed death cult, and if you read Hitler's speeches, one thing you should be struck by is how often Hitler spoke like a necromancer. Jordan Peterson's career is predicated on a lie. A big lie. The big lie. As Peterson writes in 12 Rules for Life, For the world to be turned into hell, recall his 165 references to Satan, as Hitler stated so clearly, because we know that Hitler was all about clarity, you need the lie. Peterson then quotes Mein Kampf. In the big lie, there is always a certain force of credibility, because the broad masses of a nation are always more easily corrupted in the deeper strata of their emotional nature than consciously. Thus, in the primitive simplicity of their minds, they more readily fall victims to the big lie than the small lie, since they themselves often tell small lies in little matters, but would be ashamed to resort to large-scale falsehoods. It would never come into their heads to fabricate colossal untruths, and they would not believe that others could have the impotence to distort the truth so infamously. At the outside chance that you need an explanation, Peterson provides one, saying, For the big lie, you first need the little lie, the little lie is, metaphorically speaking, the bait used by the father of lies to hook his victims. Ah, a fishing analogy. How fitting. Allow me to explain. The father of lies is Hitler and Peterson. That is, the quote is in part self-referential. Peterson baits his followers, who he calls lobsters, so that they enter his traps. Recall his claim to be warning about the conditions that led to the Holocaust, and his wish to, quote, alleviate the likelihood that you'll get trapped into doing something like that, end quote. This statement contains the little lie. Once the lobsters are in the traps, Peterson transitions from father figure to demagogue and floats the big lie, urging his barmy lobster army to stand up to the liberals and their so-called wokeness and political correctness. They claim to want a more knowledgeable, equitable, and democratic society, but we know the truth, lobsters. They're really Stalinists who want to bury us alive, or they're Nazis. Peterson calls them both. He told Douglas Murray that the liberals were today's Nazis, and in his documentary, The Rise of Jordan Peterson, he implied it was the liberals who wanted another holocaust. This rhetorical technique is known as gaslighting. Essentially, this is Peterson's big lie. You, lobsters, are being oppressed by them, the liberal elites, the educators who you probably resented in school, the freaks who constitute the quote-unquote sideshow that is the LGBTQ plus community, and all those women who rejected you because, let's face it, I recruited many of you from 4chan, the domain of incels or involuntary celibates, like the mass murderer Alec Manassian, who I have defended. Society may reject you, my little arthropods, but I accept you. I'm your father figure, and I'm here to help. Haven't I already done so by assisting you in getting your lives in order by commanding you to pay attention like the all-seeing eye of Horus? Did I not come through when I showed you the occultic tarot card originally commissioned by a Satanist? Was your suffering not alleviated when you shelled out $15 for my future authoring program? 
And was I not there in your time of need when I spoke to an organization interested in schizophrenia and the paranormal about what I learned from the occult? And do you not recall me reminding you of the truth that Adolf Hitler was an organizational genius? Now, that guy knew a thing or two about helping people get their lives in order. As I have said, what the Germans were demanding in a period of chaos was order, so that was exactly what Hitler decided to provide. And so now, lobsters, it's time to cut the umbilical cord and deal with all the present chaos. Stand up straight with your shoulders back and don't take any guff from the woke flakes. Take aim at the people who oppress and look down on you. You know who they are. I've given you the list. Become a hero and slay the dragon of chaos so that we can establish a new order. Recall Peterson quoting Hitler to say, In the primitive simplicity of their minds, they more readily fall victims to the big lie than the small lie. Elsewhere in 12 Rules for Life, Peterson says, Lobsters are still comparatively primitive. He has also said that lobsters are not very complicated, and that the reason why he likes to use lobsters as a metaphor for his followers is because lobsters don't have much of a brain. The fascist requires a legion of dummies. The leader can insult his followers and position them as primitive and mindless crustaceans, and they likely don't even notice, because he hasn't instructed them to notice. Or perhaps they are used to or like verbal abuse and are suffering from Stockholm Syndrome and are just happy that JP acknowledged them at all. Hitler insulted his prospective disciples and made it clear, for he was all about clarity, remember, that he thought people generally were imbeciles who could be corralled, made to believe, and ordered to do just about anything. Think of the Milgram experiment, which Peterson has spoken about in connection with the Nazis. Anyhow, Transcripts of Hitler's speeches from 1944 to 1945 are especially interesting. Page after page of non-stop bald-faced lies. And Peterson has learned from the master, or who he calls the master of speech. In the 1930s, hardly anyone seemed to believe that Hitler could be a genocide-minded maniac, in part because he claimed to be helping people and could make it look as though he was. People ignored the evidence, the opening of the concentration camps, the Nuremberg Laws, Kristallnacht, the passage in Mein Kampf in which Hitler fantasizes about making the Jews submit to poison gas. Neville Chamberlain's appeasement was an exercise in naivety. At the Berlin Olympic Games, Team France gave Hitler the Roman salute. People also saw Hitler as extremely dangerous, but they were in the minority. And what do we hear today about Hitler's carnage? Well, various views, from the informed to the uninformed, but a fairly common view is that the Holocaust was a hoax, or that some Jews may have been killed, but nothing approaching six million. And what do we hear about Hitler's most revered living acolyte? The one who hails from Alberta, pun intended? Oh, sure, he's alt-right, but he, he's not a Nazi. That's impossible. He's a grifter. Grifter's gonna grift, lol. What's that you say? You have heaps of examples of him raving about and plagiarizing Adolf Hitler? N no, you don't. That's a lie. No, no. I don't want to see them. I just know they don't exist. O or you're probably taking him out of context. And they don't exist. Besides, I don't do evidence. It's beneath me. Maybe you should focus on what we do know, that he had a benzo addiction. Oh, and have you seen the hairdo he had back in the 90s? He should have called his first book Maps of Mullets. Yes, and in the 1930s, people chuckled about Hitler's mustache. Yet as the clownish man with the tiny mustache wrote, it would never come into people's heads to fabricate colossal untruths, and they would not believe that others could have the impotence to distort the truth so infamously. At the Ottawa Public Library, Jordan Peterson said something similar when he told his audience that the radical leftists had no idea what he was up to. This was a rare instance of Peterson telling the truth and being correct. If you were to ask a hundred Peterson critics to tell you what subject Peterson claims all of his work to be based on, I doubt any of them could tell you. They've probably not read his books, nor have they watched many of his lectures, but they're all experts. Peterson can cite the Hitlerite passage that provides him with guidance, one that says that people are so stupid and naive that, quote, and I'm quoting Mein Kampf and 12 Rules for Life, even though the facts which prove you are telling the big lie may be brought clearly to their minds, they will still doubt and waver and continue to think that there may be some other explanation. End quote. Yet people don't realize that Peterson is revealing one of his guiding principles, which he took from Mein Kampf and inserted into a chapter called Rule 8, Tell the Truth or at least don't lie. 
during a public talk called Identity Politics and the Lie of White Privilege, in which Peterson likened liberals to Marxists and rats, which is similar to what Hitler did, he said that he had been trying to educate people about the horrors of the Nazi regime and the Soviet regime, and the steps you can take to avoid participation in such regimes. What were the steps? Trying to be truthful and taking responsibility for the malevolence in your own heart that manifests itself in Nazi and communist regimes. He added, that was the best pathway forward that I could think up over 20 years of thinking about it. In other words, he had thought of just two countermeasures, nay, two incredibly facile countermeasures, in 20 years, one per decade. Actually, it was two countermeasures in 3.2 decades, because Peterson talked about the lie of white privilege espoused by liberals who were vermin in 2017, and, if you'll recall, he implied that he had been obsessed with warning about the Holocaust since 1985. It's not that his math is bad, it's that he was telling another lie. His mission statement is flexible and contradictory, which is to say, it is a cheap and transparent lie told by the father of lies. Given that Jordan Peterson's Holocaust claim is a lie, and that we can with confidence say that it is a lie, in part by holding it up against the many praiseful and defensive statements he has made about the architect of the Holocaust, along with his cronies and goons, any conversation about Jordan Peterson that is unconnected to the subject of Nazism is irrelevant. And that is to say, in the past five years, nearly every conversation about Jordan Peterson has been irrelevant. A high school student could tell you that Adolf Hitler was not elected in a landslide, but journalists have said nothing about such bogus and disturbing claims. Where are the adults, and why have they all left the room? Across the West, fascism and neo-Nazism are on the rise. Far-right parties are gaining popularity in Europe. The German government has expressed concern over this. And the President of the United States, who called Nazis fine people, helped foment an insurrection at the US Capitol, comprised of neo-Nazis, for example the Proud Boys, and something like occultists, that is, members of QAnon. Yet when I tell people that Peterson's movement is a little like QAnon, and that Peterson is a Nazi, and, yes, an occultist, and that I have the evidence to prove it, they look at me as though I have three heads. Since Trump's departure, journalists and government officials in North America have begun working to expose the problem of white nationalism and have been taking action. Liberal media in the U.S. has been relentless in their coverage of the January 6th insurrection, and Canada recently added the Proud Boys, the Three Percenters, and the Aryan Strike Force to Canada's terrorist list. They also added an individual, a 69-year-old white supremacist named James Mason, who Canadian intelligence officials describe as a lifelong neo-Nazi and influential ideologue. This is a promising development, however they appear to have overlooked Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, an oversight that needs correcting. Again, my name is Troy Parfit, and I'm the author of The Devil and His Do, How Jordan Peterson Plagiarizes Adolf Hitler. If you would like a 57-page document called Jordan Peterson and Neo-Nazism, What You Need to Know, please email me at teparfit at gmail.com. That's T-E-P-A-R-F-I-T-T -T at gmail.com. In the subject line, please write Jordan Peterson and Neo-Nazism. Thank you for watching and listening, and bye for now.